Good morning and welcome to Never Not Here. My name is Richard Miller and uh, we're doing a Skype talk with England and uh, we're going to talk about really, I think we're going to talk about a, a healing and, and actually why we need it. You know, what is it that, uh, that we're healing from? But we're talking to Dr. John Eaton, and he's practicing something he calls reserve, re reverse therapy. So then we'll see. You. Uh, welcome, John. Hello, Richard. Nice to be talking to you here from England. It's a uh, beautiful, sunny evening here, and it's. Uh, some people say that we're born with a clean slate, but you know, I don't know if we know that. I mean, uh, somehow we're born in the vibrations of our family and our mother, and those vibrations might be anxious. So maybe that's not a clean slate. Well, I think vibrations might be an umbrella term for several different things going on. Uh, we know that the baby almost at birth uh, has a huge emotional intelligence. And we know that most human, all human beings have that inbuilt emotional intelligence. Whether the parents themselves are well accessed to that is a different question. But uh, the picture we're forming here is that the child is introduced to very close emotional connections to the parent. There's also uh, an increasing body of evidence that goes around family constellation which shows at a very early age the child is aware of his or her role in relation to the rest of the family. And of course, many of us, including myself, believe that we have spiritual vibrations that we carry with us all the time. So... Let's, uh, let's be a little more clear on what you mean by emotional intelligence. Oh, okay. Um, there are several... Um, aspects to that. One is the fact that human beings are inbuilt with emotions, fear, anger, frustration, sadness, excitement, joy, and so on. And that's a well-established fact. The brain is programmed to generate emotions on a daily basis. So that's the first aspect. And the second aspect is whether or not human beings are able to acknowledge and recognize their emotions. That is, do they have the ability to know one emotion from the other, or do they have the ability to notice when they have an emotion as opposed to something else, like hunger and anxiety and so forth? And in, one way, aspect, in one way, you know, you could say that we're inbuilt that every, everything we see or everything we take in causes some kind of a sensation. Sure, sure. In, in, that sen in our trunk or in, you know, in our body. And that sensation, uh, the tighter it is, the, then we give it a name, you know. If it's really tight, then it, it's, sure. it, we give it a more terrible name. If it's, kinda, if it's really loose and open, we give it another, another kind of a name. But, you know, are those names, like whether they're fear, anger, frustration, joy, uh, bliss, are all those names really inherent? I mean, they're like our interpretation of what those feelings sure. are, right? In other yeah, words, sure. first comes just a, a raw sensation, and we say, oh, I hate that. <laughs> well, I think you've, you've uh, hit on a really fundamental point here is maybe more precisely we should say all human beings have this ability to access feelings, sensations. And I think as we move through life, we come to recognize that one particular group of sensation is called by everybody else, anger, or this group of sensations and feelings is called fear. So a little bit of this is acquired. So we come to give these labels, as you put it, to a specific group of sensation. And we know that that group of sensation is telling us something very specific. For example, the anger group is telling us we need to be more assertive in what we do, whereas the excitement group of sensations is telling us we need to be doing more of that thing because it's so fulfilling and satisfying to do. Right, right. So then that's kind of like uh, 
what we make of our our of those sensations may be very much so uh, from the family constellation because we kind of mimic the way uh, other people in our uh, acquaintanceship uh, absolutely what they do with those feelings. Well, this is why parenting and good parenting, good teaching is so fundamental because if we have those good teachers then we become much more expert at noticing which groups of sensation go with which particular kind of situation. Um, I'm just reminded off the cuff of a, a study carried out in 1944 over here when they studied children who were in the bombing raids and it was noticed that mothers who got very anxious about the bombing tended to have children who were also anxious whereas mothers who responded to fear which is a practical emotion which involved you know making sure everybody is safe rather than just worrying about the bombs tended to produce non-anxious children those children had fear but they knew what to do about it right you you know you'd never know in a in a in just a raw young young child uh, what a bomb of course a bomb is in a way a bomb is very exciting you know i mean something is uh, there's a big Absolutely. noise there's a big flash and maybe something falls down maybe it's far away so you think whoa wow that's powerful uh, <laughs> i that's don't even know right. and that was replicated in the study you know some of these children would just look out the window and notice all these german planes flying overhead and, and they spent hours trying to identify which planes they were right i mean i mean i've even heard stories of uh the you know how 9-11, they, uh, they showed again and again and again the towers coming down and some kids, you know, what do they know? I mean, they, it's just like another movie, right? And that no movie was really that neat, you know? I mean, they said, wow, cool, you know? Sure. And so then they're just thinking that's exciting. That's a, a show of power, a show of force. Uh, somebody's yeah, killing well, Godzilla or something like that, right? Well, that's an unanxious response. And just moving the uh, conversation we're having on a little bit, for me, in my work with uh, clients and indeed with myself, anxiety is the enemy. We don't want anxiety in our life. It doesn't have a purpose. And it's triggered by another center in the brain, the prefrontal lobe, which are the center of intellectual intelligence, in which rather than um, treating the issue as something to be explored, uh, the intellectual centers treat it as something to be worried about or alarmed. So in those children, they've lost their capacity for wonder or interest or curiosity. All they're doing is fixating on the problem with anxiety. And that's not going to do them any good. Can we say um, that anxiety well, doesn't, doesn't have any purpose? I mean, or did originally it have a purpose? Or was it all about trying to seek safety? Or, I mean... Part of, I've been saying lately, I don't know if it's true, but I've been, you know, it's clear that anxiety is a closing or a squeezing or somehow your 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 most of your body is deprived of the of a of a smooth energy flow, and then just okay. late, lately I thought that maybe that's useful because that puts your energy into your limbs and lets you run and fight fight or flight. Well, in reverse therapy, which you uh, alluded to when we opened up the conversation, uh, our view of these things is that um, uh, there is no fight and flight response as such. We think that's a simplification. In fact, a human confronted with a problem, with an emergency of some kind, the person has more than two choices, whether to run away or fight something. They could negotiate something. They could get help. They could stop and think about it for a while um, they could do some rehearsals or, pro or um, preparation to deal with the problem so probably human beings have dozens of responses to emergencies so in so other words us, fight, or, fight or flight is just primordial that's just uh, kind of like mm, what a being can, can do when it doesn't have any of these other options And well I, I'm saying Richard that Fight or flight for me is um, one of Darwin's few intellectual errors. I don't think there are just two responses to an emergency. There are more than that. Of course, they put freeze too. <laughs> fight, flight, or freeze. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So. 
<laughs> no, well spoken, very well spoken. But I mean, maybe fight or flight are categories, you know. In negotiation, would be some kind of a a, a fight option, you know, that maybe you could uh, lessen the. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't need it to be uh, fight only fight or flight. But I mean, that's an that's an expansion just to see that uh, there's many many options. Well, I think you Americans are partly to blame for this because uh, the original theory out of about fight or flight came out with the work of um, researchers in the 1920s over there in the United States, guys called Cannon Bard, who were born from William James, and who first came up with the idea that we had this inbuilt, evolutionary, genetically coded response where you're going to, you only two choices were to fight something or run away from it. Don't they even ascribe that to a reptilian brain or a primitive part of our, our uh, mental or our uh, nervous apparatus and, and try to claim that it's uh, really uh, a part of the species, part of our inheritance? And maybe they do, you know, maybe that's just a justification. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe the main difference here is that some of these are biologically in. Uh, inclined psychologists who talk about fight and flight uh, put the problem in the wrong place. They saw it as a problem in the body, in the nervous system, whereas I'm claiming is that the problem is really in the conscious centers. It's the conscious centers who think, I need to fight something or run away from it. And in fact, running away from something or fighting something generally isn't a good answer. No, I love it. I mean, this is really uh, an opening, you know, because, I mean, so much we're... We say f things like fight or flight, or so many things we say so often, it, become, it takes on a reality, but it's really, where? Where's that reality? And, Absolutely. Uh, so, I, I don't think the body has that kind of uh, options, you know. I, I totally agree that uh, it's kind of a belief structure, I call it, but I mean, uh, it comes out of consciousness. Is what we react to is our interpretation, not to any kind of, kind of a event. And to bring it back to an original point you made, this comes back to human conditioning. You know, our society is often built on the response that fighting and running away is a good answer. And then children grow up believing that. And believing that somehow inbuilt into them. They can't do anything about it. Right. I, uh, I was just in a free school. And I happened to be visiting during a meeting. And, and a free school is a... Is a uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's a democratic school, and uh, discipline is also democratic. And one guy had a fight or something, and they were seeking to see if they should suspend him or what. But I mean, the whole idea of punishment, crime and punishment, well, crime can be, you know, there, but whether you should punish for it or whether you should just get around the person and hug them, uh, I don't know. That's just totally cultural. And uh, I was wondering if. <laughs> It's supposed to be free, well, it, but they're really not that free, you know. They're still in the old cultural norms. Well, that kind of resonates with my experience at school because uh, I experienced a lot of bullying at my school. And, um, you know, I, I grew up with the idea when I was uh, 11, 12 years old that the only thing you could do with some teachers and some of the other kids on the playground was to run away from them or try and fight them. And uh, William Golding's novel, uh, The Lord of the Flies, that was filmed, you know, that's based on the same premise. The, the pessimistic idea that children are doomed either to be bullies or weak people. And the bullies would, in, um, would encapsulate the law of um, the survival of the fittest. So again, this idea is programmed into us. You either got to be a bully or a wimp. <laughs> right that, that that book tried to say that that was a natural condition and when left to their natural just uh, left alone that's what, what it would devolve to absolutely it's what you were saying about the way the school system works it's ruled by terror is it not <laughs> well this one's trying to be different you know it's trying to uh, be uh, okay called a democratic school where everybody has their input but I mean, still, I was. My remark was just that that was still in the same context, uh, the same belief structure, 
that, uh, you know, I think we know in America that punishment doesn't really work. <laughs> oh, we're starting to realize that now, yeah, but we didn't realize it back in the 60s when I was, a, when I was at school. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, there's something also deeper going on here, which, it, which is the body-mind intelligence, emotional intelligence, also has tremendous healing power. If we can only start to understand how sophisticated the body is, how sophisticated our um, brains are, how sophisticated the way that the nervous system works, and how incredibly sophisticated the cellular system is. And we know there's probably over 10 trillion connections between the cells in every human body, all of which are communicating to each other in a variety of ways. And if we can experience, learn to access that intelligence, learn to make fine distinctions between feelings, sensations, emotions, and how the body is responding to situations, giving us a sophisticated opinion about what's going on around us, and to decode that opinion, and act on that opinion so that we can safeguard ourselves, so that we can get greater fulfillment and um, learn how to more if constructively love the people we care for, then I truly believe that, you know, our lives would be a great deal better. And one of the reasons I like talking to you tonight, Richard, is, your, is that your um, program is, for me, is all about helping people build that awareness so that we can become more sophisticated with these kinds of intelligence. So uh, when you spoke of this intelligence, this, this deeper intelligence, first you talked about the maybe the mechanics of it, that there's so many connections, that it's so uh, vast, let's say. We don't even have to say complex. Maybe it's uh, simple. Uh, who knows? But everything is talking to everything else, and somehow it just finds its, uh, its, its point, you know, that it's, its balance point. And then this could possibly, we spoke of healing. This is, there's a great healing force here. And then I suppose healing means that uh, when you feel whole and healed, uh, you treat uh, your world better. Somehow you don't feel that you have to push on your world so much and it's, uh, it's an opening for love and an opening for uh, respect and an opening. Exactly. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And basic emotional intelligence for me has two major expressions. One is internal and the other one is external. So the external intelligence is about being very empathetic, open and ready to receive vibrations or as I might prefer to call it, emotional intelligence from the other person so that we can work out how to have a better communication with that person. Whereas the internal intelligence, probably more interesting for me, is not only about emotions and what my feelings, sensations and emotions are telling me to do, how to protect myself and be well grounded and expressive, but also how to access my passion. Now, one of, one of your guys, one of the great psychologists of the last century, in my opinion, Abraham Maslow, who I seen to, no, he worked in New York, not Chicago. Anyway, one of his great themes was in self-development, actualization of the self, was that without the exercise of passion, people become ill. And again, one of our big themes in the work we do with people over here is that if you're stressed out, if you have a, a, uh, a functional illness, if you have depression, if you have anxiety, then of course you're going to have to deal with those situations in an emotionally intelligent way, the ones that triggered that problem. But you also have to get back your passion in some way. And here's where I agree with Maslow. If you lose your sense of connection with who you were meant to be, which is triggered by your experience of passion, then you're not going to be happy, you're not going to be very well, and you're probably not going to think that life's a very good experience. Well, there's, uh, that, that's, 
Very interesting. Now, you know, I maybe I'll say two things now because I was I was saving kind of one thing that I wanted to say that uh, you know I opened the conversation saying, are we a clean slate when we're born, or what kind of baggage are we carrying along? And then, if we're kind of more clean than we are now, uh, uh, somehow there was a process to being tightened up and to getting maybe lost in certain emotions, not recognizing them or uh, maybe simplifying them too much and saying, I need to fight this, I, I'm scared, I have to run. Uh, just making dichotomies out of, out of actually, com I hate to say complex, but let's say varied, a wide panoply of choices, you know, it's actually a richness, it's not a, a confusion. And then, uh, just now we're saying that you have to access your passion now and then how, and apparently we're lost in part of this process of, of getting tightened in our emotions and stuff we get lost from our passion or we're we're maybe um, we're requested to fit somebody else's mold somebody else's idea of what uh, a good human being is and and somehow for us it doesn't seem to work and so then if there we can't seem to get any passion going on with that type of a uh, a model we need our uh, a freedom to to find our own model to find our own passion i think sure and i i think so many people don't have a clue what passion is it's just an abstraction Absolutely, absolutely. Well, again, um, diverting slightly here, but still on track for talking about passion, is one of the themes I've lately got interested in is personal genius. And um, way back, my first degree was in um, classic. I studied a lot of uh, Greek and Roman stuff, and they had a concept called genius, that's the Roman name for what we're talking about here, but that was a translation of what the Greeks called um, daimon, or what we now might say demons, and the Greeks thought everybody was born with their own personal daimon, their inbuilt passion to do something very specific. So one person's daimon was to be a philosopher, and somebody else's daimon was to be somebody who farmed with nature. Uh, another person's daimon would be to work with children, while somebody over here would be uh, a warrior or a seaman or a merchant. So I got interested in this and think, and started thinking, everybody, it seems to me, everybody I know, including myself, has some kind of mission in life. We all want something very specific that we know we're good at. We have those inbuilt gifts. So for me, passion is about knowing what those gifts are and really, really wanting to express them as fully as possible. Yeah. And again, it helps to have emotional intelligence to know, to be able to distinguish which things are the most important for, each, for you. In my case, it seems like it goes through cycles. You know, I mean, I guess maybe you've done uh, uh, this type of work uh, in investigating uh, uh, mind and investigating personalities and, and what makes a being, and what drives a person uh, for a long time. Uh, I've never done anything that long. And let's say my passion now is to tell a story and to talk with people. Well, it never had been, though. I was always a very recluse or a very kind of timid person. Uh, or maybe in a, out, you know, maybe I was innerly aggressive and so on, but I didn't really know how to inter interrelate with people. I don't know if I, you know, for me, a passion would be of the moment more than uh, a, de a lifetime definition. I don't know if I could okay. ever be a seaman <laughs> or a, Okay. Well, we, we could look at the, the reasons that you and I are here tonight. Uh, my reasons for talking to you and being with you and having this discussion with you is an extension of my interest in um, human fulfillment, human well-being, health, the exercise of passion. So I see myself, my particular passion, maybe connected to my what I would call my personal genius, is education or the transmission of ideas of some kind. And I would guess that you yourself, given that 
you're here with me tonight and you have your your website and you do a lot of this kind of work is you too have this passion passion for the transmission of ideas for enlightenment and aware awareness and helping people be the best they can right you know i i'm i i just feel like uh so much about what we say about life uh, is not very flexible. Just like saying that uh, our inbuilt mechanism uh, of our body is fight or flight, or one of the okay. one of the mechanisms. And then when you say uh, no, I think it's consciousness. I think it's and and I was saying that too. I think it's the story we tell ourselves, or that we got used to saying, or it's a. It's the interpretive mode that we're born into and that we're somehow accepting and always interpreting in the same way. And uh, at least I know from the interpretation you can, you can have a mood, you can have an aggression, you can have, you know, and you can change that interpretation uh, and, it, and that goes away. Now, whether there's actually inbuilt interpretations that are not connected to a story. So when you say something about the consciousness, could be the driver of our uh, of some of our emotions and some of our responses that don't seem to uh, to flow well in society. Uh, then that's a freedom because consciousness is something we can look into. Whereas body, the way we descri- described it, is a mechanism that's more or less fixed for the moment. It might, okay. you know, and then so then that freedom could maybe make the world work and uh, and and give relief to a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, we, ad, adverting to another topic, which is around this theme, is that one of, in my opinion, one of the great, great transformations or evolutions that have occurred in the last 20, 30 years has come out of the United States almost entirely. And that is a revision of the idea that we are driven by mechanical forces, that uh, the conscious mind is separate from body mind that they have no interactions, that human beings are meant to be some kind of super rational creature which has nothing to do with emotion, works things out by logic and, and rationality. And the picture we're building, and I can mention the name of Candace Pert here, who's a huge influence on this new way of thinking, is that in fact human beings have many different forms of intelligence. And one of the major ones is body-mind intelligence, cellular intelligence, nervous system intelligence, emotional intelligence. And that's all being exclusively backed up by very expensive brain research. So now we're moving away to the, from the idea that people are simply driven. We're moving towards the idea that people um, are incredibly subtle, complex, deciding creatures. So the part, the rational part, if we were supposed to just be rational and uh, be logical, of course, that's all abstract because it's all language based and it's based on a sound. It's just based on a series of sounds that have been ascribed meanings over the over the ages. Sometimes when you yeah. read the dictionary, uh, the, the meanings are really pretty good, you know, and they've actually devolved out of that and been used in a rougher way. But still, it's only words and we you know, words are always changing. Otherwise, we would never be discovering anything. I mean, we're discovering uh, more and more, in, not only every year now, every day. Uh, yeah, it's such a Science is so expanded, and uh, all those discoveries are, are changing old word patterns for new word patterns. So those old word patterns weren't very good. Uh, they served at that time, but now the new word patterns are are supposed to be the you know the light. But tomorrow there'll be a new word pattern again, and uh, so then uh, these logic beings. I mean that's an evolution in a way, but I mean it's not really that connected to to uh, to our our lives. It's uh, we maybe try to connect our lives to our logic. And that might be the great uh, um, passion killer, the great uh, difficulty, the great uh, uh, problem with uh, with trying to live a natural and easy in an easy way. Sure. Well, again, what you're saying, Richard, got me um, recalling some other important aspects of this subject about what really determines what a human being is, and that is. Uh, some more U.S. research into whether or not there's free will. Now, in the old model of 
um, thinking, what we might call the Cartesian view, is that human beings have logical thought, which then determine their will, which then lead to a decision, which leads to something happening. But more recent brain research shows that is not, in fact, the case. What we're seeing here is, is that we have experiments in which human beings are asked to make a simple choice, whether to press a red button or a blue button, for example. And they're linked up to brain scans, which monitor what's going on before and after that so-called decision. And what we're hearing about is that the brain, the brain is actually processing the decision between a half of one second and one second before the person actually presses the button. It seems to suggest that the body or the brain has already made the decision before so-called conscious mind thinks it's making the decision. So again, we're seeing deep structures of intelligence at work, which the conscious mind has no access to, no awareness of. It has the delusion that it's making choices when it's not. I guess in the spiritual speaking that we do, and I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but we're kind of looking at life as uh, part of a life is just eminent, just this moment. Just, you know, I mean, it must be all of it, really, because uh, none of us have really ever visited uh, yesterday or tomorrow. I mean, right. all those, uh, so much of science, actually, and, and all of time is uh, kind of inferred. And so then uh, what, there's some kind of a mechanism that allows us to infer that uh, things are changing and so on. And, and that mechanism must have a lot to do with our memories because we remember that it used to be this way and now it looks like different. And so then there's an inference that uh, change happened and process happened and time passed. And, uh, but we never are able to visit that, you know, we can't just go to yesterday and check it out and say, well, what was it again that I did yesterday? <laughs> we can't go back to yeah, it, you Absolutely, know? absolutely. The and whole thing goes on without much intervention from us. Yeah, and so then uh, we totally believe in, the, in, in something that's uh, basically inferred, you know, and uh, all of space and time and science and uh, human relations are built on that. And uh, that's okay. That's a kind of a life that we're living, but somehow uh, that part of life is not alive. The only part that's yeah. really alive is this very moment right now. And uh, so then you, one wonders if anything besides humans uh, know about time, you know, because if you don't have a, a memory capability to, to notice that something was different uh, uh, and now it seems to be in, in another shape or form, like, I mean, a tree or a mountain or a river, I don't think they know about yesterday or even one second ago. Well, you're, you're bringing in awareness now, which I know is um, an important theme on the, uh, on the other interviews you've run and indeed on your website. So alluding to that for a moment, I'd like to bring up two points. The first one is that in a highly mechanized, industrialized, over-complex society such as the ones you have over there in the United States, the ones we have over here in Europe, human beings are subjected to an overwhelming number of stimuli, triggers, cues, which tend to make life more and more mechanical, which tends to give substance to the pseudo-scientific argument that we're rational creatures constantly responding to intellectual triggers or coded triggers, you know, traffic lights, uh, the social code, marital relations, job rules, regulations, so on like that. If I may say, you know, maybe all those stimulations uh, actually numb us uh, in a way that we're, we are, in a way, standing back and, and throw us into the abstract, you know, and the abstract is, in a way, a numbness itself. And Absolutely. So we see an increasing abstraction in the way we live our lives. So we honor that abstraction more and more and saying rationality is the, is the best thing in uh, uh, that yucky old real life, you know, <laughs> that you can't control it. <laughs> Indeed. So, you know. Again, 
con the constant theme is human beings are abstract creatures. Consciousness is abstract. But when we move over to the, the other big transformation that's going on here and over there, the increasing movement to awareness, to present moment awareness, to the practice of that awareness, to interest in yoga, Tai Chi, Zen Buddhism and so forth, we see that human beings are starting to uh, wake up to the fact that if you want to have a really lived experience, one that's not abstract, rational, empty, or in some way false, then you have to come back to that present moment awareness and its exercise. And when that happens, going all the way back to emotional intelligence, you start to build those connections that bring you into an encounter with your passion with your emotions, your feelings and sensations as they progress from moment to moment. So when we were talking about emotional intelligence and healing power, then this is like allowing some time to, uh, to step out of the abstract uh, or step into kind of real life uh, uh, ambient is somehow that healing power, that natural intelligence and that... Uh, so I was just saying, Richard, that um, coming back to the great American psychologist I mentioned earlier, Abraham Maslow, uh, for him, uh, getting out of abstraction, getting out of the head, as we might call it, and coming back to the lived moment, the experience of the now, led also to self-actualization, but also to something what he called being cognition, which was a moment of complete absorption in which the human being becomes one with her passion, one with the world, one with the project she's engaged on, and one with her emotions about it. Those, and, are, really uh, two, those are really two good words. The one is uh, being cognition, and the other one is the lived moment. You know, we shouldn't lose those. I think we should kind of talk around those. Those are, are good vo vocabulary. You see those two terms as interchangeable? Um, I haven't looked at it that way, but I both of them struck me as kind of like a, a new way to speak. The lived, this lived moment, it's a very simple way to say presence, but the lived moment. And then okay. I wasn't so sure what the, uh, the other one, cognitive, or, uh, uh, well, meant. Uh, Maslow's problem was that he was mostly writing in the 1960s when psychologists were desperately sound, trying to sound scientific so he came up with abstract labels for what he was trying to communicate so he called it being cognition but I think what he really meant was what you just said you know lived experience in the now but he also commented that experiences of this kind of consciousness were marked out by features such as um, absorption intensity feelings of great joy and excitement or passion and a sense that one was doing what one, what one was meant to be here to do. You know, in, a, in other words, a fully lived human being. Yeah, that's a little confusing because, uh, you know, when you, when you start to put a purpose on, on life, then uh, you wonder who, whose purpose or how long does that purpose have to hold true. But but certainly, uh, just to be here uh, is uh, really uh, a, a plus <laughs> in living. <laughs> sure. sure. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about Maslow's studies was that it threw up some surprising results. I mean, he started out with the assumption that people like artists and um, scientists and uh, athletic players who were pretty reasonably good at what they did, they will be the people who would have this kind of consciousness or um, passionate, exciting, absorbing state of affairs. But in fact, he found that wasn't so. He found so-called ordinary people, housewives bringing up children, um, office workers, provided they were going out doing um, what they really wanted to do outside their working hours. All these kind of people reported this kind of cognition, this kind of consciousness. So what he realized was that the factor wasn't so much whether somebody was 
so-called superior or gifted in some department, but whether or not they were committed to living in the moment, doing what it was that they were really excited about, whether that were children or athletics or writing or painting, whatever, it didn't matter. Well, uh, when you're when you're looking at your life and you're here to see it, uh, I think that makes a big difference than if you're just looking at the abstractions about your life. So then the abstractions about your life might be pretty sad or pretty intense, and your life here might just be uh, in kind of a neutral ground. It's not really that intense, but your abstractions are the, what's driving that uh, intensity. And uh, so then to take a true look, it does kind of require some present moment living. Well, I agree that what you call abstractions are, um, are a feature of what we call passion. But if we look at it in a little more depth, if we take somebody who's interested in human rights, who fights for human rights, that's his or her passion. We might say that person is uh, driven by the need for justice. So that would be an abstraction. But for me, if we look at it a little bit more closely, what we tend to see is that these people, um, say Martin Luther King, for example, he's a very good example of what we're talking about. His lived experience is that he was seeing his community uh, victimized and uh, bullied or, mute or abused or excluded from opportunity. So he's seeing his friends, he's seeing his family, he's seeing other black people not having the life that he thinks they deserve, and that makes him angry. And that anger fuels his desire to see something different. So although we can say he's fighting for justice as an abstraction, for me, he's being driven by more personal experiences. I wonder, you know, exactly if he was driven by anger, he would probably come out with angry responses. So it must have been something a little bit more refined than anger because he came out with very uh, uh, intelligent responses to uh, not use anger uh, as his, his, the point of his sword. And whether it was anger that uh, drove him or it, maybe it was just a belief that things could be better. And that uh, a belief that uh, maybe uh, a system like a constitution that says there's justice could be worked around and maybe uh, people would have to accept that document and somehow laws could be passed and, and openings could be made. I don't know exactly where, what his motivation was, but I'm okay. sure there was some passion in it, but if that passion had to be fiery, I'm not so sure it has to be fiery. Okay, two points there, Richard. Uh, one is I completely agree with you. It wasn't probably wasn't just about anger. Uh, he was um, a man who was an inspired orator, so he was a man who could be very persuasive. He had a good gift of language, and all of those, of course, require intellectual skills. As far as anger goes, um, again in my line of work, we don't consider that anger requires people to be explosive or go into a rage or to get into hate or to be nasty to people or confrontational. We see anger as a hot emotion at fueling people to be passionate about standing up for themselves, but in a constructive, channeled way. And I think that was one of Martin Luther King's great gifts. He saw that you weren't going to get anywhere by just... Um, uh, doing riots or trying to fight people, that the best way, like Gandhi's, was to convince people through nonviolent communication. And then the other thing you alluded to, which I completely agree with, is that he had more emotions than just anger. He had an enormous sense of compassion for people who were being excluded from opportunities and the life they deserved. Somehow, in order to act, uh, no matter what we do, we somehow have to believe that that action is going to somehow be effective or somehow be uh, adequate or uh, 
uh, functional. And, I agree. Uh, and how can you get that broader belief? Because the, the narrow beliefs that say that, uh, oh, nothing can be done and uh, I'm stuck and I'm a victim and uh, these guys are always against me, these kind of ideas, and they are abstractions too. I, I believe that there, maybe there's some evidence and maybe it's happening right now, but uh, maybe it's uh, an abstraction. And how can you adjust those abstractions to, uh, to be more broad-based? Is that what reverse therapy uh, handles? Oh, I don't know how to answer that one. We should. Um, maybe one answer I can give you, thinking again about um, the civil rights movements in the late 50s and 60s over there, is there's no question that there was a huge change going on in American society. And um, maybe those civil rights or some of those civil rights uh, leaders believed that the time was right for this kind of movement, that they would eventually be able to be heard, eventually be taken seriously and create changes, whereas maybe before the Second World War, most, um, most of those people who had those desires would have thought, this is impossible, we're not going to be heard, so there's no point in complaining about it. Then I guess that leads to the deeper question is how does somebody decide they're a victim? Do they decide that by observing and modeling other people or participating in a certain kind of community which is being victimized? Or is it an intellectual error? Do they conclude they're victims when really they could do more to um, express themselves or to make changes or to have a better life. Well, in a way, I mean, there's 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 abuse going on, right? I mean, I guess there's abuse, there's a physical abuse, there's abuse, and uh, whether you call yourself a victim from that abuse or not, I'm not so sure. I mean, it's kind of an idea that I could be a different way, or these guys could treat me different, or I could be uh, I could be accepted. I mean, maybe um, looking into the UK, into Britain and seeing what the history of Britain was, and there was a noble class. And, we're, and you know, there was kings and queens and, and, and uh, dukes and earls, and I don't know the whole thing, but uh, did people feel they were a victim because they, could, they worked on, on somebody's estate? Did they feel that they should be a king too, uh, that they should have the same rights? I don't think they did. They just thought, no, this is the way it is. There, there are kings, yeah. and then there are us people. But we want a little bit better deal, you know. But I mean, uh, that was what you say they more accepted. They accepted that, that this is the system, this is how it works. Well, I think the subtle point uh, you probably seems to me you're alluding to is that indeed, in, say, in 400 years ago, somebody who didn't have a great life and had to work 14 hours a day on somebody else's land and, you know, was getting bullied every time he committed some minor. Um, trespass on the rules thought no there's not much I can do this is the way it is so I have to live that way and then intellectual social changes in conscious uh, intellectual and social movement changes in consciousness come along and people suddenly start thinking oh wait a minute I'm not a victim there is something I could do to change. or even this ought to change so it comes back to the point that so-called personal consciousness is one very small part of social consciousness. Our head mind, our intellectual equipment, cannot be separated from the environment, the society and the culture we live in. We carry most of those, in, of those implicit ideas around with us in our head, and sometimes mistakenly allude to them as personal ideas. Right, we always think they're personal, right? Because we really don't have a uh, an anchor in the social. I mean, we're there, but we uh, we always have our angle, our slant on it. So then we're thinking, uh, I mean, that's a separate person. Everything is me. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, that's the ego again, isn't it? So again, in head mind, in the, in the constructions we carry around inside our skulls, we have the idea that. There is an ego or a me or a self 
that is somehow separate from the rest of the world. And again, this increasing interest in awareness, present mind, present moment awareness, um, mindfulness, is a correction to that mistaken idea. Strictly speaking, we don't have personal egos apart from the names and labels and ideas that we carry around in our head. So kind of going back to like, uh, if there's a process, if there's a process that we, we get confused and tangled up and tied up. Now, some people cope pretty well with society, apparently, at least up to the point of functioning and having jobs and, and raising families. They might have some kind of like angst or some kind of emptiness. But then there's other people that don't really uh, function very well at all with their fellow man. And uh, maybe that's something that they gradually built, uh, this, uh, this, this ability of, uh, of, of being part of society. And then uh, if there is a process to that, and you know, I, when I hear you say reverse therapy, I think there may be some way to put that, th that mechanism in, in backwards gear you know, and, and, and undo it. And I don't know, is that something like uh, what what you've come upon? Um, well, I can only say yes. It's over, my overwhelming clinical experience of working with uh, my clients who complain about um, stress, distress, anxiety, depression, functional pain, um, other kinds of conditions is that they're unhappy people. They also seem to me uh, to be trapped in a cycle of um, abstraction, uh, disconnection from the body, disconnection from present moment awareness, disconnection from their own emotions and their passion. And also, in a very deep way, alienated. I mean, you, you like to use the word abstraction, which is a good word, of course, but part of that abstraction is an alienation, alienation from themselves, deeper alienation from other people, alienation from their own passion, just as if all that had been diverted into a mechanical, over-rational, um, victimized experience in which they see themselves as moved around by other people, external forces that they don't understand. In a way, that's that you know that's like uh, a symptom of it that they're that they're focusing on other people and injustice and so on. But I mean, uh, the mechanism of it to me seems like I, I say abstraction, which means uh, we're linguistic beings that they're lost in these descriptions. And that these descriptions are not that much tied to what's happening in this moment, here and now. They're more tied to the way we used to describe yesterday and the, and the way our parents described and our grandparents described or, or somehow whatever our, our uh, experiences of life somehow got us going more, more and more abstract and more and more, like you say, alienated from what's really here. And so yeah. then we live this life that, uh, in one way, abstraction is terrific because it's so wide and varied, it can go anywhere. You know, one guy that comes on our show, he says, in, in what's not happening, anything can happen. <laughs> you know, abstraction can go anywhere, totally, even to a black hole or a, a big bang or things that are really not happening at all, you know, but we can really spend a billion dollars on, on just investigating black holes or building the CERN uh, particle accelerator or, or something like that just to, uh, to work with abstractions. But, uh, and sometimes it's a lot of fun and maybe something good comes out of it. But what I'm saying is that uh, this is a great place to get stuck uh, on something that, you know, and then you've called that alienation. And when that just gets uh, overcooked, you know, too much alienation. Somehow, the being breaks down, uh, or his his yeah, he breaks down too because if he can't function with society or, or his fellow man, uh, it, it, he's not alone. He's not a lone uh, edifice. He's a, he's a part of a machine in the whole humanity, and uh, that's where that abstraction gets dangerous. 
Well, I think um, what we're touching on here is a very um, terrible condition of many people's lives, and that is that inwardly they feel, or rather they think, they perceive themselves as being very, very lonely. And for me, having experienced it myself, this is one of the things that most tend to put people in a place of illness rather than a place, place of well-being. That sense that they're lonely, nobody really understands them or cares about them. And that in turn is a, a reflection of their perception that they don't understand, they don't have a connection to other people or what's going on around them. And for me, uh, good healing work is deeply entwined with dissipating that loneliness of restoring people to that connection, not only with themselves, but also with other people and with the natural order around them as exercised through present moment awareness or mindfulness. From that starting place, we can start to build people up again. So, I mean, is that a direct uh, connection, like present uh, moment awareness uh, and can, can really impinge upon a sense of loneliness? How does that work? Well, speaking from personal experience, you know, so, uh, I work in London quite a lot of the time, which, as you know, is a huge city. And uh, if I finish my uh, casework for the day and I'm just going back to a hotel, I can sit in a hotel room thinking, oh, I don't want to be here. I hate this place. I don't like the way they coloured the walls, but I don't know what to do. Shall I switch on the television? Shall I go for a walk? Shall I call somebody up? And I can get into a, a very bad state that way. But again, if I go back to practicing Tai Chi or meditational work, or maybe if I do something with focused awareness for a while, suddenly the whole problem vanishes. I'm not stuck in my head worrying or thinking or anticipating problems and thinking in that abstract way that I don't have a connection anymore. I'm back where I should be. And then head mind, the intellectual mind, quietens down, the alienation, the worry, the disconcertment isn't there anymore. I can see where the worry can, uh, you know, can, can be calmed down and, uh, you know, the, the, you can have a, a more comfortable life that way. But mm, what my question was is because you said many people are lonely, you're still alone in that hotel room. Or when you're in a calmer state, you can say, well, I'll just go down and have a chat with somebody and see who's, who's willing to talk, maybe. Okay, yes, I, I see what you're getting at here. So we're talking about my experience where I actually have a good or reasonably good uh, set of connections around me, my wife, my children, some good friends, or other connections, community, and you're contrasting that with somebody who is actually alone, who doesn't have any friends or family or support. Is that right? Right. Okay, so mindfulness isn't going to work for those people. That That cannot be the only solution. Although it can be a partial solution, we have to find a way for that person to integrate back in some kind of community. And I fully admit that not always or even mostly an easy thing to do. We have a huge social problem where millions of people don't have that kind of social support. But I would argue, is that something we can do as practitioners and therapists and healers? Or is it something we should be doing as a community? As a practitioner, I suppose, we, we, we can try to uh, smooth people out so they're not so full of judgments. Because if they're judging other people, that this guy's wrong for that, these guys are stupid for that, this, and then they're never going to go out to the, or this guy is too smart, you know, and I, or you might even be ever the opposite kind of a, um, a judgments that I'm not good enough to re relate with the other people. But until you can kind of uh, loosen up on some of those judgments, then uh, other people seem to be... Uh, threat. Sure, but again, on the assumption that the person has potential friendships, partnerships, relationships they could engage on, but their intellectual mind has got these judgments and preconceptions and beliefs that are excluding them from that. We can do a lot of work with that, absolutely. 
It seems Again, that, it seems that uh, life worked better when we lived in a village. <laughs> then we were just, uh, you know, everybody was connected. And there was, you know, you might be the village idiot, but still you were connected. And you might, and, and you were probably a prized person too. Maybe uh, uh, the funny guy or the, who knows. Well, that's slightly funny, Richard, because um, we live here in a village here um, about 50 miles west of London. And uh, it's quite a large village, but it's still a village. Before that, we always lived in cities or towns, London or Newbury, which is the nearest town here. We've been here five years, and I feel more alienated here than I did in the city. <laughs> wow. And it, it has something to do with the claustrophobic things that go on in villages, where uh, I have the sense that I don't have as much space or privacy, privacy as I used to have when I lived in London. So maybe that's a paradox. Sometimes yeah. communities can be too intrusive. That is a paradox. Yeah, because I, uh, uh, back in the beginning of the conversation, when I mentioned that I had gone to this free school, and that I, one of the ideas of the free school is that there's no grades, and that everybody studies together or apart as they wish. You know, they can come in and they can come in and out. And, and I would say that in a way, that's kind of like a village because uh, uh, everybody's included, and, uh, and and mentoring can happen in an easier way than in a stratified society. And uh, and your social needs are really uh, handled in a way automatically. Yeah. Well, I'm irresistibly reminded of a time when I was studying for my uh, PhD at Lancaster University up in the north of England. So they had a campus there, and I was there for five years. Uh, again, it was a replica of the village situation. And some of these head mind conflicts and um, vendettas that were going on remind us that too much intellectual activity is not necessarily a good idea. So then that's, I guess, uh, that's kind of touching on uh, reverse therapy ideas when you speak of head mind and, uh, and body mind. You're, Sure. You're speaking of the present moment awareness and uh, and uh, or abstraction and alienation, or the possibility of abstra of alienation through abstraction. I suppose abstract people could be together. They don't necessarily need to be alienated, but uh, there's a chance that uh, it could. They're alienated from some things. Well, I think uh, again you're alluding to a quite subtle, profound point. Maybe I've been giving head mind or intellectual mind too, um, too much stick. Maybe I'm being too hard on head mind here. We need to be reminded that head mind has created language, civilization, architecture, science, philosophy, painting, music, all these wonderful things that enrich human life. So it does have a very important purpose. And for me, the real problem is intellectual mind that's alienated and it's not connected to other things or emotions and passions that are alienated and not connected to head mind or to the social order so we really need to remind ourselves that alignment is the key here we all we need all these different centers to be working well together emotions personal genius passion head mind creativity decision making rationality connected to the wider society or the community. Unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, to a large extent, our communities are in a mess. So that gives us a big handicap. But we can still work on aligning head mind, intellectual mind, the body and emotions with present moment awareness to create a more wholesome life within those limitations set by community failures. One thing we said uh, uh, earlier was uh, that maybe uh, much of anxiety is not really doesn't have a purpose at this sure. point. And so then is that kind of could that be used as a metaphor? In other words, we can notice the level of anxiety and we could say, well, I mean, maybe we can just diffuse that in some way and just uh, work on a less anxiety uh, 
uh, quotient, and maybe that less anxiety will just naturally bring us into uh, into community and into uh, balance with all the different uh, possibilities uh, that are vibrant in a in a human being. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, you've summed it up perfectly for me. If you're having anxiety, that's a signal that your intellectual mind, conscious mind, is working out of sync with everything else. It's focusing on things like guilt, worry, perfectionism, disaster, uh, negative self-judgment, and, and so forth. When the, the cue here would be that body, mind, and other centers are sizzling up, we want the intellectual mind to get focused on something that works. We want it to look at working with other people. We want it to focus on building a better life. We want it to focus on dealing with the emotion. We want it to focus on a project. We want to focus on friendships and relationships and not just stewing in that endless round of guilt and self-recrimination. That's kind of how Western society works, unfortunately, is that we prioritize all the events uh, the, or the presumed events in our life, and we uh, usually get a call to action on the worst ones, the ones that hurt the worst. And then these Absolutely. are things like energy crisis and, uh, and, and global unrest and, uh, and uh, our environmental problems and, and somehow they, get, they have to get so hot before we can just act upon them that uh, it seems like the anxiety level is our major call to action and uh, maybe we should just look at that maybe just looking at that and saying well it has it worked and maybe we should just uh, work on things more from from uh, even a joy of of improving things uh, yeah. okay again i'd make that distinction between fear and anxiety Anxiety for me is tr triggered in the um, prefrontal lobes, in the conscious mind thinking centers, whereas fear is generated in the nervous system by body mind. For me, a pretty good example of that was what was happening with the tsunami in Japan and the breakdown of nuclear reactors. And our experience over here in England, God knows what it must have been like in Japan, which we were scared. We were scared, is this going to poison the atmosphere? We were scared, is this going to set back the world several generations? We were scared, is this going to add to all our existing problems? And people started seriously um, responding to that with huge uh, missions going on over here, trying to put out help to Japan in the same way people were putting out help to all the other disasters we've had around the world. I think fear is the motivator here, not anxiety. Isn't the fear an anxious response? Also, anxiety to me is a is kind of a closure of uh, um, or a contraction, and I think fear is a contraction also. So then I was kind of confusing those two. Sure, I, I think it's a common um, conception of. Uh, anxiety and I have to admit here I'm being just a little bit uh, individualistic in the way I'm making these distinctions because so far as I know there isn't that much agreement about the distinctions I'm making so they're very personal to me and they're very wound up in the practice of reverse therapy so we're arguing that anxiety is a head mind response which isn't productive whereas fear is a body mind response which is encouraged focused action of some kind and of course, to make the obvious point I think you're alluding to, is that there were incredibly anxious responses to what was going on in Japan recently, as well as a lot of fear-based responses. There were a lot of people panicking about what was going on in Japan, but without doing much about it. And there were a lot of people who were scared or filled with compassion about what was going on in Japan and trying to do something about it. Right. Uh, when you can move from, uh, with some positive action, I suppose that's, uh, you know, what, even if that's motivated by uh, anxiety. But I mean, uh, now you just said uh, fear was, it shows up in the body mind. The body, it shows up for sure. But didn't we once say that fear is kind of like uh, there's some, some element of consciousness in it? 
Indeed so. So we're getting to uh, grey areas here, here, in which I don't pretend to have all the answers. We know that the uh, there's an area above the right um, eye, just above the eye socket, the orbitomedial uh, area in the frontal lobe, which is largely concerned with assessment and decision making. And we know that because the brain scans teach us that these areas are very, very active when people are trying to make their minds up about something. And we also know that this particular area has a direct, fast link to something called the amygdala in the emotional brain. And the amygdala is a kind of a little bit standalone in that area, it does make independent decisions. And what we see happening here is that an anxiety response, a worried response, triggers fast action from the amygdala, which then over arouses the nervous system. And then we get the typical experience, the internal experience of anxiety. So on the one hand, there's some solid evidence that thinking centers trigger anxiety. On the other hand, we can see that there's an interaction here between the thinking centers and the emotion centers that give rise to anxiety. The only way I can think about this at the moment is that there is a, a deep fault in the way the body-mind works, in the way the brain works, and the emotional centers work, and the nervous system works. Because what we see so often is an anxiety response that is way out of proportion to anything going on out there in the real world. And if somebody, well, coming back to our example of bombing experiences in the war, children and mothers, some children were able to adapt and accommodate what was going on without getting too upset and disabled, whereas other children were getting paralyzed, crippled by what was happening. And that seems to be tied into our very neurology. How much consciousness there is about that, I don't know. Maybe just a little bit. Yet all people are different, which means like it kind of indicates that uh, um, things can change. You know, even something that seems inbuilt in one uh, maybe is different in someone else, and maybe that there is some kind of a therapy or some kind of a, a way to ease, bring ease. Well, I would say that any therapy worth the name has to do something about conditioning. So to come back to your point about consciousness here, I think for a lot of anxious people, people who have high levels of anxiety or regular periods of anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, I think they're responding to conditioned ideas that are put there in the head. I don't think they're responding with awareness or choice or consciousness. They're just responding to the stock content of what they grew up with. Right, and so then is that uh, kind of like the usefulness of uh, some present moment awareness? Just to say, do you, can you just uh, in, see that something is not here now, and uh, even though the feeling of it is here? I think present moment awareness gives you more space so that you can look at what's going on in head mind and go, oh, I don't have to own that idea. I don't have to think the same way my parents or my teachers taught me to. I can treat that as an idea that's hovering around, but I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to get upset by it. And I think that leads on to a further process where people can start to become more and more aware of their own mechanical reactions of how they've been programmed to react rather than how they're deciding to react. And then little by little, they can separate away from those automatic responses and live another kind of aware another kind of existence. So somehow getting looser. And, uh, and at first when we just totally identify and say, well, that's what's happening, that's here. And of course the feeling is here, right? And so then that's where, where it's a little bit difficult to pick apart because the feeling's here, but uh, um, the so-called cause of the feeling uh, is not necessarily here. And you say, well, it could be here, you know? Maybe I'm just getting ready. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, again, you're, 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 make, you're 
encouraging me to make finer distinctions of what I'm saying. What you're saying there is absolutely right. There's identification with the cause of anxiety, conditioned thoughts and ideas, habits and expectations, and so on. And there's the anxiety itself. And one very unfortunate thing about anxiety is that it's so powerful and overwhelming, it's very difficult not to identify with it. It takes a lot of work to do that. So sometimes in, uh, in our other talks about spirituality, uh, breakthroughs came after great stress. And, f and finally people just threw it all down and says, I can't handle it. There's nothing I can do. I'm a failure at it. You know, whether it's a meditative technique or whether it's just trying to get along in the world. And, uh, and somehow and this, these, these, this uh, bursting happens and when it gets just too big. But we're actually trying to avoid that because we don't want to take people to uh, um, stronger and stronger reactions. We kind of want to diffuse the situation. So then sure. what is another possibility? Well, uh, just to pick up on a slightly earlier statement you made halfway through your, your, your last comment, Richard, what we see in anxiety is it becomes a vicious circle. The more negative thoughts and worries, guilts and burdens you're carrying around with you, the greater your anxiety. And the more intense your anxiety, that tends to reinforce all the other thoughts you're having. So you have even more thoughts that generate even more anxiety. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And that leads people to conclude that they're victims, they're powerless, that they're, they're just mechanically reacting to forces over which they have no control. So then, uh, I guess we're looking for the key, uh, uh, or some kind of a key, uh, about diffusing anxiety. And you did say there was some center uh, over the right eye that makes yeah. decisions or somehow, I mean, is that something you can interact with? Or you, can you just talk about uh, what type of decisions, or uh, is that something that... Uh, um, vocabulary or uh, talking. That's an can... interesting question because I think you and I agreed fairly early on in this interview that we don't have access to those brain operations. They're outside consciousness to a large degree. So essentially we can only deal with their products. So although I can't determine or even look at what's going on in the orbital medial network here above the eye socket, I can notice that what's coming out of those centers are frightening thoughts, worries, um, overwhelming burdens, a sense of hopelessness, guilt, perfectionism, all those bad products. And I can work on those by um, indirectly working with those products, which are the conscious thoughts themselves. So the moment I notice I'm engaging in that kind of thinking, then I need immediately separate away from, stop, disconnect, and switch my attention elsewhere. And again, we come back to this continual theme of exercising present moment awareness so that I can do that more and more quickly and more and more efficiently without getting sucked into things. Aren't those thoughts kind of based on uh, some kind of a syndrome or some kind of a, uh, a belief structure that says this is the way the world is working and this is the way it impinges upon me? And then oftentimes, could we make a, uh, another kind of a story up that, that slightly shifts that? And uh, I don't know, you know, we don't even have to really believe it or say that mm, this one is more remote than that one, so I, you know, this one is where my feelings are, so I'm going to stay with mine. And in other words, if we tell people we're going to get a better story for you, they're not going to believe us. But if we just say, try some on, try on a different interpretation, and see, see that things could be different, it feels different, and then try another one, and another one, you know, and then you'll start to realize that there's a whole galaxy or a constellation of, of, uh, of different interpretations. Each one carries its own moods and its own emotions, and then you can start to say, well, maybe it's arbitrary. Maybe those, the, there's not any of those that are just all rock solid the way it is. And, uh, and from that, you can just start to loosen up on the, on the one you have that's, that's causing so much havoc. 
Well, I like to think that's the reason you and I are having this discussion today. We're hoping to increase that awareness. You know, we're hoping that people will watch this program and think, oh, wait a minute, there is another way of looking at this. There is a space for me to work here. There's another space for me to get well or to get happy or to have a better life than the one I've got now. Absolutely. That's what, uh, that's what I'm all about. You know. That's your passion. Right. <laughs> so here we are, two passionate guys, you know, trying to say, share a little bit and say that it, it's not all that bleak for those that, uh, that maybe think it is. And uh, maybe there's no one right way uh, for those oh, that think there's one thing. right way, you know, and, or one goal. And that when we speak about our passion, we're speaking something that's more personal uh, to us and that uh, it doesn't have to be look like someone else's. In fact, it probably never will. And uh, to realize that, that we are our own individual and the way it is is, is, uh, is the way it is. And uh, we, we, can, we can in some way celebrate that. Yeah. And of course, passion is personal. It is also impersonal. We know that from art, literature, and, and um, other products of culture going all the way back for four or five thousand years now. We know that we all have that shared heritage. We have a shared passion. We are all the same in many ways in terms of our biological makeup. We have the same inbuilt drives. So that can all, just that realization can also open us up for those that are feeling lonely or feeling alienated or feeling like uh, the rest of the world uh, is either not good enough for them or too good for them. Uh, uh, maybe just realizing that there, there's a great mm, recognized sameness, even if we don't seem to feel it. And we don't have to start to say oneness or things that uh, uh, seem to be rather abstract to many people. Uh, but we could just say that uh, there is a, a, a common heritage and a common biological heritage and that uh, we can just uh, kind of focus on that for a while and see what, what makes us the same as other people and, instead of what makes us different. Absolutely, which reminds us also that there's more than one route to doing all the health-giving themes and self-fulfillment themes you and I have been talking about. I am a uh, psychotherapist or a reverse therapist, uh, a practitioner in different disciplines and areas, and I hope that gives uh, the majority of my clients the health they're looking for. But they can get the same health by engaging with yoga teachers, with um, art, painting, novels, poetry, and also I hope by watching radio shows like this. So in other words, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's just to restructure your life a little bit and leave some time, for, uh, leave a space for something like yoga or something that could be more present moment awareness and not sure. just concentrate your whole life on uh, abstract, uh, figuring things out and, uh, and, and maybe suffering uh, the emotions that, that that sense of alienation brings. Yeah, uh, yeah. That restructuring that life, uh, if that could happen which means like go to the community, go to the library, do, do something else instead of watching the telly all the time. Uh, try to uh, connect, right? Absolutely. Well, if there's one consistent theme in all the work I do, which comes up and up again, is this sense that the, one of the most important ways for human beings to be well is to learn how to live in the moment. Without that, everything becomes very, very difficult to achieve. Right. And again, we're speaking of a balance and we're speaking of structuring your life to have some of that, uh, some, some time to live in the moment. And because other people will jump and say, oh, I'm always supposed to live in the moment, but I am having thoughts, you know, <laughs> of course you're having thoughts. You're a human. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow. That sounds really wonderful that uh, the work you're doing and, uh, and, uh, and the distinctions you bring to a conversation. Uh, Dr. John Eaton. 
Thank you, Richard. I thank you very much for being here. Uh, my pleasure.